Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty with my guest, Jerome Wagner. Jerome, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Father. Jerome and I have known each other for quite a few years. As a matter of fact, he was a student of mine at DePaul High School, and he graduated in 76. I left there in 78, and moved on. <laughs> so what Jerome has been involved in is very important, and it's a, a hot topic. It's a, a church topic. It's a, it's a people topic. It's a humanitarian topic, and it is climate change. Okay. Um, how did your experiences in high school contribute to where you eventually wound up? Or did it? Uh, did it is did it might be the better way to put it. But I'll, I'll say that at DePaul, I found that I had an aptitude and interest in things like science and mathematics. So that disposed me when I was looking at a career to pick engineering. Um, oh. And I worked as an environmental engineer for 30 years in the southern tier of New York State, specifically in Endicott, New York. And where and did you go to school? I went to school at Rensselaer Polytechnic in Troy, Great. New York. Um, so I would say that, you know, my school experience of finding those aptitudes and being nurtured in, you know, in that arena helped me end up where I am. But I'll also say, I mean, I think that the Catholic education also had gave me a foundation of values that I will say, you know, also got me where I am. Good, good, good. Okay, so you, you, you decided with the with the background in science, you can go to Rensselaer. Um, what did you get involved with at, as an undergrad in Rensselaer? Okay, well, naturally the studies of environment, en environmental engineering, uh, which at the time focused also on chemical engineering types of disciplines. So things like distillation, you know, so that particular... No, no. When you hit me with, uh, you know, I, the answer is going to be, no, I don't know, but it's science, but you can, you know, just fill me in. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, right. I think the short story is that I was not very socially active either in high school or in college. Now, I did help to initiate a club, an environmental club that we called the Society for Environmental Awareness, C, S-E-A, which I thought was pretty interesting, but... In uh, high school? That was in, in college. college. Okay. In college, but that was my senior year. You were so that, you were a quiet kid in college. I do remember that. Well, in, in high school, certainly yes. I mean, no, no, um, I'm, I'm, I meant in high school. Yes. You were a quiet kid in high school, yes. and you were very bright. I do remember that. Uh, of course, <laughs> <laughs> you would remember that. Uh, so, so uh, it, I, activism, like I do now, came to me very late in life. Okay, so you started that little group, and then you continue your studies. And the first job brought you into? Well, the first job I landed with was with IBM uh, at their birthplace in Endicott, New York, uh, where I spent a 30-year career in, in wow. continuous service there in different branches of environmental engineering, mm. air pollution, water pollution, bulk chemical handling, chemical rec reclamation, hazardous waste disposal, those kinds of things. And. Just so you, our audience, knows where we're going with this, you realize this is science, and what do I have to do with science? I don't know much about science, but he, it, Jerome, is speaking about the environment, and you know who my best friend, Fran, Pope Francis, gave us that beautiful letter on Love Dr. C that we're going to refer to later. But his whole focus of that, this, this is our family, this is our life, this is our world, so we have to take care of it. So we're right on target as far as the, our foundation goes, from the spiritual as well as the scientific. Yes, yes. Uh, now, I'll, I'll add that I finally started to become a little bit more socially aware while I was raising a family. <laughs> I also was commissioned as a lay minister in the Dar Syracuse of Diocese in the area of parish outreach. But some of the courses, that, some of the courses that we took were uh, Catholic social teaching and the like. Sure, so sure. again, I think that that's, uh, I mean, an important foundation for Catholics, um, and it certainly was part of my foundation. And I also started to work with a soup kitchen in the area. I didn't, I, I didn't lead in an overall sense, but I took charge of one particular month, week, each month with a certain crew, you know, to cook the food, serve the food, clean up afterwards, and so forth. So that was sort of my and first state. first well, dabbling with uh, social justice type of types of issues. How did, how did that get into your system? Into your soul, you might say. I, th I think that on, with a little bit of reflection on one's life or conditions, around oneself, one can come to those kind of realizations. 
I think so. Whether it's through meditation or contemplation or just being quiet or doing some, you know, reading that's relevant, I think one can find that kind of thing. And then obviously when you hear stories of people who, who act from that place, I mean, that's also emboldening and, you know, it makes one think in a different way. Mm. So I think, it, I think it's a genuine looking into your heart and, and, and being aware of what's happening in there, you know, which is the action of God. Um, you know, and then translating that in some meaningful way into your life. In Catholic theology, we say faith builds on nature. And, and uh, this is a good example because your faith was building on the nature of you as a scientifically oriented individual who is also close to his faith in the area of service to others. So very interesting. I think it, there's so much of our theology as, Christ, as Catholics that apply to almost every aspect of our lives. And this is a beautiful uh, connection for us. Okay, so you, you did social outreach and you got more involved. And where did that lead you? Okay, so I enjoyed a great career with IBM despite some changes in ownership and so forth. Um, but uh, around 2009, uh, I read An Inconvenient Truth by, you know, former Vice President Al Gore and that was a, cha a distinct changing point in my life. From my, from my perspective, what was shown here, you know, information-wise, data-wise, picture-wise, made it unavoidably clear that there was a problem mm -hmm. with the climate. And because, maybe because of my background, maybe because of my interest in science, whatever, I decided that that would be a, a chosen field of activism for me. Wow. So you, you're out of school. You're, you're working or have you left? At that point, at that point, I was still working. You were still working, but you're, you're going to focus on an area of, well, I'll say Christian activism, but activism right, nevertheless right, in right. the world. Okay. And where did that lead you? <laughs> uh, well, it's been a great ride. I mean, in the meanwhile, I've become <clears throat> prematurely retired. So at this point, um, this kind of activism is, is the mainstay of my daily life. Um, so it's led to a lot of reading. It's led to traveling to places I would not have other gone, otherwise gone to, including to Paris for the meeting of the Conference of the Parties last December in 2015. Yeah, we'll talk about that at, at sure. later on. I want, I want to know more about your inspirations from An Inconvenient Truth. Okay, well... Uh, there, this is a, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a very picture oriented, uh, book with a lot of information, you know, which would satisfy a, a technical mind like, you know, like mine, whatever, but it shows, it shows also in graphic ways and pictures, the changes that have been happening around the world, whether it's glaciers, you know, no longer make, you know, being as large as they were at one time, or whether it's forests subsiding in in Alaska because the ground is thawing underneath them and the trees no longer have a, a, a firm basis to be on um, you know to discussions of you know impacts on the um, the Gulf Stream and other currents in the water you know so uh, for me I mean it doesn't just it doesn't just look at the problem from one narrow perspective like impacts on glaciers. Mm -hmm. it, it, does, it was a survey of basically all indications that existed at the time. And this was in, this book was published in t 2006, I believe. Um, so it was a, a very thorough, in my mind, review of the, the state of knowledge at the time. And for me, it was compelling with no reserve. Mm. What, what do you, as far as you know, what are the, uh, the people who would be contradicting this this information. What, what is their foundation? Uh, that's that's a good question. Yeah, I'm asking you to be the devil's advocate. And that right? also defies logic, frankly. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, in my mind, for people to deny climate change or to deny that humans, that us as a society, are having some impact on the climate, to me that is completely irrational, and imprudent, and unwise. But where do they come from? There might be, let's say we had a cold snap. When we, a couple of years ago, we had the polar, what was called the polar vortex thing right, happening. Right, right. And we had a period of very cold weather. Yes. Deniers will say, it still gets cold. It's not global warming. It's not a problem. Other people would say that if, even if, 
even if, if, if a single scientist stood out from the whole crowd and said, I don't believe it, they would point at this one individual and say, well, because he says he doesn't believe it, we don't believe it either. Mm. There's clearly not consensus. But I think, again, some of this goes beyond, it goes into the area of wisdom. If we're presented with, infer with a, 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 a vast body of knowledge that says we have a problem, we need to be wise enough to act on it. So, but uh, there could be profit motivations. There could be mm. shareholder mm. motivations. Um, right now, if we stop using fossil fuels, which we need to do, there will be gigantic repercussions in the financial markets for, for major companies like ExxonMobil and so forth. If you say you can't drill anymore, they are now out of business and they, they have staked their business on leveraging all of those assets at some point. So, I mean, there are many reasons, there are many reasons that deny, well, Again, I would say it's irrational. I don't really want to talk about it no. further. It's irrational. Yeah, you're back at them. Um, when Barbara Stamba was here, she's she's a part of a climate change group in Pompton Lakes. Uh, she spoke about fracking and, and its implications. So you're right there with that. Okay, so, okay, let's go to your issues and, and your um, idea of climate change now. What role do we play as America, as, as people, humans? Well, you started to ask the question, what do we start to, what's the role as Americans? And that, that's actually a good place to start. Okay, because go with that one. I think we have, <clears throat> I think that America, the United States has a pivotal position in this whole issue of climate change. We are, by and large, we help to develop the industrial basis that is causing climate change. Mm -hmm. The, you know, extraction of fossil fuels, the pervasive burning of it, the high level of energy use in our society, whether it's for personal convenience, for transportation, or right. for electrical use and air conditioning. We, I, I would say, and up until a couple of years ago, we were the major emitter of, of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Now, that has only recently changed in the, in the last decade, but up until that point, we were the leader. So, regrettably. You know, we, exactly, regrettably. So, um, so and, and our, because of our position in the world, um, I think in, we have tended to be a respected voice in the world. So, what we, what we, how we acted made, it, made a difference to the rest of the world. Mm. So, if we start to question the you know, the need to act on climate, many other com com countries will look and say, well, if they're, if they don't care, then I guess there's no point in us caring. That's, so that's one. Following Big Brother's example, regrettably. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the concern. And I'll just add, add on that, that there are many ways to, I mean, on the question of what's the solution to climate change, I would say, the best answer that can be given is it's a, it's a billion different ideas a billion times because at this point, it, it, I believe it'll take the action, the ongoing action of, of everyone to look at their investments, to drive their car less, to turn the lights off when, it's not need, when they aren't needed, to turn the th thermostat down to mm. 68 or mm. 65 or maybe even lower. You know, I, I believe... So I, and, and there'll be implications throughout the economy and throughout society, but I think that essentially it'll take a billion different people doing every what they can on a daily basis. But every one of us, exactly, we, we can all participate. I, I think so. You eventually went to the Paris um, conference, and I want to talk about that in our next uh, segment. Great. But give me one thing that came out of that conference. Okay, so one of the... If, if you can give me one. There, but that's, actually, I'm, pr I'm prepared to answer that question. Okay, good. All right, good. so <laughs> one thing, well, two things. I'll give you two things. Okay. All right, so before the Paris Climate Conference in December of last year, 2015, the UN group that is coordinating all this activity looked at all of the contributions the countries were going to make. And they tallied up, what does this, how, how far will this take us? It's a, it's a mathematical thing. We've been mo doing models. So it was a question that could be answered in a tangible fashion. The countries of the world, including the United States, countries of the world were aiming for two degrees Celsius for the maximum amount of increase of global temperature. And in fact, the plans that had been submitted only allowed for 2.7 to 3.5 degrees. So I'll give a school-based example. It's like the students went home, they were told to do a certain type of work, and they came back and the work just wasn't, it didn't meet requirements. 
the world did not meet requirements for, for COP21, that conference in Paris. They were supposed to target two. When they put all the ingredients together, it came out to two and a half to three and a half, which is astrono an, an astronomical difference in the, in the amount of temperature. And, and those kind of differences are astronomical. The, the, the second point was, at the end of the conference, the public was convening near the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and one of the chants was, un, deux, trois degrés, c'est un crime contre l'humanité. One, two, three degrees, it's a crime against humanity. Wow. Perfect place to stop. And later on, we'll hear from Jerome what his experience has been there in Paris for the climate change conference was. Thank you very much. You're so enlightening. And, so, um, I, and I'm sure, myself included, we're going to have to rewind this tape and watch it again and again just to cap capture some of the essence. Thank you, Jerome. And we'll continue. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you, Father. This has been Father Louis Skurdy. And I'd like to hear from you, Father Louis Skurdy at hotmail.com. And later on, we'll give you some. Uh, bylines for Jerome and some of the organizations he recommends for all of us. God bless you. Keep the word alive and well.